One of the joys that I had when we were involved in two-year program where we had students in the preaching program studying all day long is that you got to talk about the Bible all day long. And students, maybe I should say especially preacher students, can come up with all kinds of questions. Some of them are quite insightful. Some of them you don't know where they came from. But nevertheless, you had your mind centered on the Bible, answering it, discussing it. People were there who were interested in knowing what God wanted them to do and wanted better how to teach it. That was an enjoyment. But on the other hand, a long time ago, I learned that if you were going to wait on a lot of members of the church to carry on a conversation about the Bible, then there'd be very little conversation ever found. Now, you might find out they're talking about their families and their jobs and, oh boy, especially politics. But if you're going to wait to visit with a lot of members of the church, then if you wait for them to bring up the Bible, then you'll be waiting a long time. That's not to say that people don't ask questions about the Bible. There are always those that do. And that's great. There needs to be a lot more of it. But there's something else that even goes beyond that. We teach from the Bible all the time if we're teaching the Bible, and if we're talking about eternity, that Christians are in a select group. They're different from anybody else on earth. You see, a person who's a Christian has already died once and has been given a new life. For when they were baptized into Christ, they were baptized into his death. The old man was crucified with him, if you please, and was buried, and when raised in that watery grave of baptism, all other things being as the Bible describes, then they were raised to walk in newness of life. They are a new creature. And we're taught that if we remain faithful, then while we may have to undergo physical death, we also have in that same Bible that Jesus has taken the sting of death away. Because we have hope. All too often we use hope as most people do today. But you've heard me many times define hope as it's used in the scriptures. And hope as it's used in the scriptures means what we have a right to expect because we're faithful children of God. When we die or if the Lord comes back first. But it doesn't begin and end with just the right to expect it. There is also the yearning for it, the desire for it, because this world is not going to offer you anything different tomorrow than it offered today or a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago or a thousand years from now if God permits time to go on. The Bible still teaches that this world is a place of wickedness. Where, the Satan, where Satan has his power and that he is totally against you and against me. And if you've obeyed the gospel, you're not one of his. He certainly is against you. And we're warned through most of the New Testament that once you become a Christian and you enjoy that new life in Christ, you must be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So as I said, we don't have a lot of brethren as they ought to be, talking about the scriptures and what do they mean and how do we apply them and how does this fit here? Though they may talk about all sorts of other things. There's certainly not much talk going on about going to heaven. When was the last time you actually talked about to a member of the church about going to heaven? Just think for a minute. When is the last time you talked about dying? You ever notice how we're, we're, we see death all around us? It's always been here. We read in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment. But we don't talk about it. Oh, why must you be so morbid? What's ahead of you? I know what's ahead of me. I know that the sting of death's been removed. Why do I know? Because Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, told me it had. Jesus, through him, told me it had. Well, what about the hope that's beyond the grave? Hope means an expectation with an earnest desire 
to receive what we as children of the living God have a right to receive. I've heard it described this way, this time of year in particular. You may even see this before the spring's over. A little nest of birds, maybe they're two or three days old. Have you ever bumped their nest? The little heads go up and they're just trembling, anticipating what they have a right to participate, to expect. Her mother giving them something. That's built into them in the DNA. That's a good way to describe the hope of the Christian. The right to receive eternal life and an earnest desire to receive it. Someone has described hope as that which reaches out beyond this fear of the devil and his work and our faith being tried, and it sees the reward, and it brings the future near. So the Bible clearly teaches that we are saved by hope, that we are sustained by hope, and that we actually live in hope of eternal life. Titus 1, 2, Romans 8, 24, and verses 15 through 13. Now, notice it didn't say we're saved by hope only. Any more than it says we're saved by belief only, or the blood of Christ only, or by the Bible only, or anything else only. The Bible says there are a lot of things that save us even as those on the day of Pentecost, having heard the word, were picked in their heart and cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And he told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Then if you go down a little later, you'll see that he told them that they're to save themselves from that crooked and untoward generation. So even we save ourselves and we do that by faith in Christ and the gospel system and a willingness to submit to his will. But hope figures in there for the faithful child of God. It brings the future of eternal life nearer to all of us. I, I may be the most eloquent dimension of Christianity is this very substantial quality that really braces up and undergirds our very being and is a great blessing to every one of us who are faithful to the Lord and to keep us faithful every day of our lives. Even when there are all sorts of burdens that will come upon us and certainly that's the case. And it reminds us of the words in a song that L.H. Jameson wrote where he says no night is there no sorrow no death and no decay no yesterday no morrow but one eternal day and then the chorus O Zion lovely Zion I long thy gates to see O Zion lovely Zion when shall I dwell in thee? Now we sing that song from time to time, but do you put the earnestness in it based upon your in-depth faith in Christ because you're saved by hope? Faithful servants of God always look beyond this veil of tears and the pale rider of death to the land that is fairer than day. That hope saves us because it gives us purpose purpose in each day of our lives gives us purpose and it gives us an anticipation even of dying which has now become a doorway in which we can enter into glory Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 15 19 without hope we would be of all men he used these words most pitiable well just think of how many pitiable people there are they have no hope of everlasting life if they even think about a life after life in the flesh. But I pause here to say all too often, we discuss those things of the flesh. Accomplishments in the flesh. Our hopes are placed in the here and now. Our, our aspirations have to do with the flesh. But when you read your Bible, Old and New Testaments, 
How far do you read before it's focusing on the spiritual, and especially the New Testament, eternal life? Of course, when loved ones die in the Lord, we have this great assurance that we're not to sorrow as those who don't have that hope because we do have a hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18. But never define hope as a wish because all too often I wish this would be and I wish that would be and it's my wish that this would take place. You miss the whole biblical teaching of hope and why it is such an important part of the Christian's life and how it is, as Paul said in Romans 8, 24, that which saves us. Of course, such occasions spur us on to, at least it should, it was designed to, to greater zeal for the Lord, a longing for the golden day of eternity. When we'll be with all those who had the same longing properly built in them by the truth of the living God. There's another old gospel song that brings this to mind in which we express to the Father, ever thankful am I that my Savior and Lord promised unto the weary sweet rest. Nothing more could I ask than a mansion above there to live with the saved and the blessed. So what love the Father, our Heavenly Father, bestows upon His children that we should be called, as John put it, the children of God, 1 John 3, 1. If we as weak human beings can desire for our children good things, as the Bible defines good, and the best even in the flesh in this life, how much more so does our Heavenly Father, who knows all things, desire for His children eternal life? On the other hand, how sad for those who never should have been born if they choose a life of shame, sin, and spiritual ruin, Mark 14, 21. I say that because the Lord used that terminology. Be better that such and such had not been born than to do what they did. To die outside of Christ, there's no way to describe the eternal tragedy that that is, John 8, verse 21. To be without the hope I've been talking about, and the Bible expresses itself on many times to a great extent. And to live apart from God is too horrible to contemplate, and if you try to contemplate it, your mind can't wrap itself around total, complete separation from God, Ephesians 2, 11 through 16. Now, people have the idea, and you'll hear it, well, God assigns people there. No, God lets you go where you choose to go. That's how merciful he is. Hell is a part of God's mercy because we're free moral agents. And when we reject the only way to heaven, the gospel and obedience to it, he mercifully lets us go where in this life we chose to go. That we don't think about. Now, it's not mercy in the sense of I forgive you of your sins because you loved me and obeyed me. It's mercy in the sense you're not prepared for heaven. And heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And this is God's schoolroom of life. And the Bible is the textbook. God leads us by the truth of the Bible. And the devil tests us to see how faithful we are. And how much we love God and trust him and his gospel. To have nothing precious to remember when we come to the end of our days here. When life is completely over. And to die with cause for great regret spells doom and loss for countless millions that could be written on their tombstones if they have a tombstone since the Lord Jesus has the words of everlasting or eternal life that will judge us all in the last day John 6 68 and then especially chapter 12 verse 48 it's very unwise to say the best to march toward the final moment, unprepared and completely void of biblical hope. Now I pause here to say, why is it then that preachers all over the land that are faithful to the gospel and elders who strive to oversee the church that they shepherd, why is it that there are members in every one of those congregations 
who though they know they obeyed the gospel to be saved from sin, there had to be something on their mind there about not losing their soul in hell. There had to be some desire to be in heaven. How is it that there's just a terrible effort with some to just get them to attend the services of the Lord's church? Well, actions speak louder than words. The hope we possess as Christians is truly dynamic in the sense of like dynamite is a terrible explosion. We need to have that faith in God that gives us fervency. It overwhelms the past because we're anchored in the future. And properly so because we know what the Bible says about the future. And it tells us what we can expect and who's going to receive. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Our Redeemer made it possible for Christianity, and I've used this so many times, to be the land of beginning again. Because I said back earlier, when a person obeys the gospel, believing in Christ, based upon the truth of God's word, Romans 10, 17, repenting of sins, Acts 17, 30, confession of faith in Christ, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins by the authority of the Lord. Then we have that opportunity, as I said in the beginning, to be a new creature in Christ. Our sins, our old alien sins that separated us from God and condemned us if we died in that state to a devil's hell, are washed away. Acts 3.19 Those transgressions that separated us from God are all pardoned. Isaiah 55, 6 through 7. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul wrote, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Now, the question I need to always ask myself, because I always am in this land of beginning again, if I need to repent, confess sins, and begin again, is that really, is there any difference in the way I think and what I talk about, what I yearn for, what I work for, who I associate with? Is there there any difference in me and the person who's not a Christian? who has no hope, and they're all around us in this secular, materialistic world. They're anchored in the here and now, if you can call that being anchored anywhere. Those willing to obey the Savior, as I've described, by faith, repentance, confession of faith in Christ, and being buried to the Lord in baptism for the remission of sins, continue following Christ by obedience to His will the remainder of their lives. That's the way that's right and cannot be wrong. And presently, while we're still here on earth in the flesh, this hope gives substance and it gives depth and it gives meaning to all of our activity throughout the day. And if we don't pause and think about that and love to discuss it, we'll never be like the old lady I heard about. She was very old and decrepit. And she sat, as people used to, on the front porch in a rocking chair she'd had for years. And when you went by sometimes, she would be napping. But if you listened closely as she rocked, she'd say, I want to go home. There's nothing wrong with us when we say we're the children of God and heaven's going to be our home, but we never yearn for heaven. We're planning on what we're going to do for vacation and complaining because gas is so high and all the stuff that costs. People in heaven don't concern themselves with that and those here on earth ought not. Now you say, it's always those that gets us into trouble. Of course God expects us to live as a human on this earth. We're in a fleshly body. He knows what we need, but he tells us over and over again in one way or the other, that's not where you need to place your chief interest.
those things I will take care of if I come first and the work of the kingdom also. There is the if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that, as James says in James 4.15. We're sustained in the vibrant power of a closer walk with God as he guides every one of us continually, Isaiah 58, verse 11, by his gracious, merciful, and benevolent hand, Psalm 84, 11. He is truly our everlasting portion. The friend who sticks closer than a brother and the one who guides our feet in the way of true peace, Luke 179. Well, then that means if we live daily like the Lord said we should, our future, whatever it may be, tomorrow, 10 years from now, whenever, our future is also bright because the sovereign God is in control. And there's not a thing in the world going to happen in this world. He's unaware of, it's going to catch him off guard. Or he'll have to say, whoop, I wasn't expecting that. As is promised, he will guide me with his counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Psalm 73, 24. You believe that? Now the last two verses of Jude inform us that God is able to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. Christians, therefore, have, as we sing sometime in the song, a foretaste of glory divine and joy unspeakable, 1 Peter 1, 7 and 8. And it's found in the rich hope that attends true Christians in their present life. Mark 10 and verse 30. We ought to love our brethren because they also named the name of Christ and submitted to his will and being baptized into Christ. They're here with us this evening. And after all, you know, we're going to be with brethren like that throughout eternity. (coughs) Yes, I read my Bible of Ahab and Jezebel and I come over to the New Testament and I run across and an Sapphira. They were members of the church, and for all practical purposes, if you were observing them as we observe one another, you'd never know that they were guilty of such sins. But then on the other hand, we have Aquila and Priscilla, we have Paul, we have Timothy. We have those wonderful, faithful saints. And that's the way it is today. We can choose who we concentrate on. We can choose to concentrate on the hypocrites, or we can choose to concentrate on the good people who love the Lord and keep his commandments. And we can choose to visit with them and talk about them. And won't it be wonderful there? It like I've heard that expressed somewhere in a song. I wonder in a glorified state when this whole system is long gone forevermore and there's no wickedness, there's no sin, there's no consequences of sin, there's no place for sin. I wonder if we will sit down in the glories of heaven and say, J.D., do you remember such and such back there on earth when we struggled with this? Brett, do you remember when we determined to do this? And who led us through it? Who got us through it? Who led us gently home? Well, it was Christ. And a lot of it was through the hope of eternal life. If you're not a Christian, you don't have this hope. You cannot go home tonight and breathe a prayer to your God and thank Him for your salvation through Christ and your obedience to the gospel. You can't do that. And if you die before morning, you will not enter into glory. A child of God that's known the truth and lived it, but still chose the world as if he hadn't, is not going to have that expectation of a band of angels coming after them as Lazarus did. (coughs) So now's the time, as is true of every day we're alive, to make corrections, to begin again, to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things you've added unto you. 
to love the Lord with all that you are and have, your neighbors yourself, and to love the brethren. To be convicted of what you believe on the basis of the truth of God's good word and then live accordingly and support one another as we walk the straight and narrow way, the only way to heaven. We've studied what to do to become a Christian. If you're not, we urge you, please, by the mercies of Christ, to obey the gospel of God's power to save before it's eternally too late. The child of God, are you faithful? Can you actually say as God searches your heart now, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? If not, you need to repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. God's lovingly given us one more time together here to worship him, to study his word, and this great fellowship of the saints. What will you do with it? And how much will it strengthen your expectation with an earnest desire to receive your eternal reward somewhere out there in the future? If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.